So the Theologia Crucis, which is the theology of the cross, the theology of the cross. What's the theology of the cross? Okay, it's all about what Christ has accomplished dying on the cross. Point to a crucifix, boom, theology of the cross. That's the theology of crucis. All right, true enough. What else fits into the theology of the cross? Um, grace. <laughs> okay, grace, forgiveness of sins, that's a big part of this. Suffering fits in here somewhere. Kolb actually has four subheadings under the theology of the cross. And this is interesting because he packs more in here than most of us are used to packing in. And he realizes there's a lot going on here in the theology of the cross. And the first one is making a distinction between how we understand God working. Oops. Deus means what? The wild guess. God, thank you. Who you guys know Latin? You just know it. Deus means God, all right? So Deus is God. You guess that because in Greek, theos is God, and we study theology. Theology is the study of the logos, the words about theos, God. Deus is Latin for God. Absconditus is just that, abscond, hidden. Okay? Hidden. Stolen away, out of sight. Deus absconditus. Deus revelatus is just what it looks like, revealed. So the reveal God. Luther had a really great understanding into this, and we came to realize that God functions sort of both of these ways. The hidden God is the God who is just not easy to understand. The God who's there and messing with you. Okay? The God who lets your car get involved in an accident. The God who lets your little sister get crippled. The God who doesn't give you the husband at the right time. The God who's just messing with you. Why does he do what he does? Tsunami hits on December 26th and wipes out tens of thousands. Why? Could God have stopped it? Well, yeah. Why not? What's going on? See? And this is the kind of God who leads to all sorts of question marks. You begin to wonder about what's going on here. And the deus absconditus, the hidden God, is the God that the philosophers are trying to figure out. Where'd the world come from? What are we doing here? What makes everything hold together? Where's it going? What's the purpose? And they try to figure stuff out. And they're trying to pry into, they look around at the world and they say, hey, this happened and this happened. And, hey, this, how did this all work? How do we, where's God fit? And the hidden God is the God who is there, and we're aware of him, but we just can't figure him out. And if all you have is the hidden God, the deus absconditus, you're left terrified, frustrated, scared. How do you understand this God? You're left with a pagan religion trying to buy off God and appease him, offering sacrifices, trying to make him manageable, trying to keep him in check, trying to figure things out. That's what the deus absconditus does. That's the hidden God. The hidden God scares the worries out of you. When Luther was in the monastery in the late teens, early 20s, and he was, or late teens, and he was trying to come to terms with God and who God was and trying to figure God out, he was trying to come to terms with the hidden God. He knew God was there. He knew God had a will for him. He knew he wasn't doing it, and it scared him. And so the deus revelatus is the revealed God. And how does God reveal himself to us? Well, in Jesus, in Christ. And the revelation also comes in other ways, and we'll talk more about this, in what we talk about specific or general revelation. And specific revelation is when God comes and he speaks his word and he comes to us in Christ. General revelation is where God is showing himself to us just in the world around, and that leads off into this kind of hidden God that scares us. So one of the things of the theology of the cross is that where you see God revealing himself and telling us what he is all about is precisely at the cross. 
That's where God has revealed himself and shown himself to be who he is. And there we see a God who loves us and cares about us. So that's one of the first parts about the, the um, theology of the cross. Is we believe in a revealed God, not one we're just trying to figure out through general or through natural revelation, which only leads us to a scary, mean, arbitrary, who can figure him out, hidden God. We have a God who has shown himself to us, and that's where we cling. All right, second part of the theology of the cross has to do with epistemology. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to re- go on a limb here. What's epistemology mean? Very good. Epistemology is the study of how you know what you know. How do you know what you know? And this gets back to some of that first stuff I was introducing to you. You can learn through rationalism. You can learn through empiricism. You can learn through you know, careful study and through the scientific method. So epistemology is how do we know what we know? How do we know what we know? Ultimately, for Christians, we have to take things on the authority that God has spoken in. And so we have an, uh, an epistemology based on the revelation of God in Christ, and so that becomes our authority. It's true because God has shown it to be true. God has revealed it, and we trust it. The thing is, a lot of people say, well, that's a silly way to base your life just because someone said it. But the fact is, we do that all the time. You know? How many of you know that a nuclear explosion or you know, if we had widespread nuclear war that it would destroy the world? Why do you know that? Have you done experiments? Have you seen it happen? Have you done the physical work? No. People who have PhD behind their name say it'll happen, so you say, okay, I believe it. We take stuff at face value all the time. Have you heard the news? Plane went down in Greece. How do you know what happened? Were you there? No. Why do you believe it? Someone told you, and they're, they seem trustworthy. And they had video. Could have been created, though. You don't know if it was true. They showed a couple of F-16 scrambling on one network. There's a couple that went up, and they said, file tape. So it wasn't the real F-16s going, it was just other F-16s, and it looks cool because you got to say the word, you got to give them a picture. But see, we believe all kinds of stuff on faith value because of the authority who says it to us. So to say that the Christian faith is ultimately based on the authority of the one who speaks is not just a sort of uh, grasping at straws, it's not arbitrary. We do this all the time in life. We believe the authority because the authority is trustworthy. And the theology of the cross says our epistemology is built, revealed, based on God's revealed authority, and we have access to him in the cross. That's part of this. Another part of this is the theology of the cross is that the cross is the way to life. The cross is the gospel. So when we talk about the theology of the cross, we're talking about the gospel, God's forgiveness being the heart of this whole thing. Christ gives himself on the cross so that we receive the forgiveness of Christ. Luther talked about this, he called it the joyous exchange, that Christ takes my sin and he dies for my sin and then he gives to me his righteousness and now I live in his righteousness. That's the joyous or the blessed exchange. And then finally, a part of the theology of the cross is this idea of our crosses our suffering. And a theology of the cross, a theologia crucis, helps me realize that even the suffering I endure in life is pointing to Christ and is giving me union with Christ. He suffers for me, and now as I suffer in this life and experience hardship, that is my cross and is bringing me union with Christ. Paul talks this way. The sufferings we bear join us to Christ. That's part of the theology of the cross. That's also one of our presuppositions that we, go, that we deal with. That in our daily life, in the horizontal realm, when we deal with hardships, it's okay. It's the way life is. So one of the strong underlying currents of the theology of the cross is um, God never promised you an easy life. And that a Christian does not have necessarily a happy or an easy life. You realize God never, ever promised you anywhere that you would be happy or that you would have a good life, as you define it. What he promised is to be with you. What he promised is to see you through, through all things. And what he promises is to conform you to his image. (laughs) Yeah, 
conforming to his image means conforming to the cross because that's what Christ is all about. And that's what God is showing us what he's all about. And so if you're going to be conformed to Christ, that means you're going to do what Christ did. Suffering's part of it. It's not a shock. It's not an aberration. It's not a mistake. It's just part of the way we deal with life. And as Lutherans, we make a big emphasis on that. We realize that. So we're not about a prosperity gospel, which is quite popular among a lot of TV evangelists. You know, God wants you to have a new Cadillac and to be happy. And if you're not, then you're not being blessed by God. And we don't buy that. We would say that God works through all kinds of situations. And sometimes suffering is where God is showing himself the most clearly. And that's where God is working for us. We know that. All right. Questions about anything here? Yeah, we've been all over the place. You think, man, it's just scattered as can be. No, I'll grant you that. It will start to kind of pull together. And what we're going to do is we'll draw back on a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, and it'll start making more sense as we go forward, I hope. Yeah. When you were talking about authority, I was thinking undergraduate in sociology class, uh -huh. they talked about legitimate authority versus not legitimate authority, uh -huh. and that's a perception in the minds of people around the authority figure, and it de it determines how people react to mm -hmm. authorities. Sure. And, and I couldn't help but think about that. Sure. Well, see, the, the, uh, to, to follow an authority, we do it all the time. The issue is, is it a trustworthy authority? Is it an authority that deserves my, my allegiance? You know, and so that's what makes the difference between a, a David Koresh and a Christ, quite honestly. You know, David Koresh is an authority. People follow him based on, well, he's saying things that are really important. But is he a legitimate authority? We would say no. And so there are tests to the authority. And so for a Christian, one of the tests is, does um, what the authority is saying cohere with the rest of what God has said? Does it also cohere with experience? And uh, that plays a bigger part in this than we want to admit as Lutherans. We tend to be, you know, who cares about experience, who cares about feelings. But that plays a part as well. Okay. But yeah, you're right. We'll, we need to, we'll explore that more. And if not in this class, as you go through the, your career here, you'll get to unpack that more. Yeah. Well, just trying to understand, I mean, we were talking about the presuppositions. Uh, yeah. You know, we were talking, um, I was trying to kind of conceptualize it into maybe more succinctly. You know, mm -hmm. you said, well, well, God is, God gave us the document. Um, well, we have law and gospel mm -hmm. and the theology of the cross. Mm -hmm. Was there, was there one I missed in that? Well, I think you're missing the two terms, righteousness, but that's a personal preference of mine. Well, you, you, you had discussed that as part of, okay. No, it's different than the long gospel. Yeah. Okay. Not the same. Right. Yeah. Right. But, uh, you know, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. We could, we could spend all day just talking about presuppositions that we have and how yours might be different than mine. And see, the uh, fact is, we're all sitting in this room Lutheran, but you all have different presuppositions than I do. I mean, you've got different world experiences. I could throw out a word, and that means two different things to two different people. And that's just part of it. And that's one of the realities of what we deal with in this world. And so one of the, the most important things I'm trying to get across at this point, I suppose, is just be aware of the fact that you have presuppositions. And start trying to figure out what some of those are and be honest about them. Uh, see, it does no good to stand up in front of a Bible class and someday and say, hey, we're just reading an objective truth. Here's what the Bible says. Come on, be honest. You need to stand up in front of the Bible class someday and say, here's how I'm reading the Bible. Here's why. I got these presuppositions, and here's what I have. And so I read the Bible this way. Let's just be honest about it. Because to, be, to find objectivity is fruitless. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as pure objectivity. It doesn't exist. And if you're fighting me on that, it's because you're a modernist. Okay? And if you're saying, I don't believe that. No, you can be objective. You can get, pull yourself out. It's not true. And only a modernist believes that. You see, even in science, scientists are starting to believe this. You do an experiment, the experiment itself is messing the results. You know that. If you guys have done any kind of stuff in engineering or science stuff, you, you're messing with the results. And, you, and the more detailed you get, the more it messes things up. Objectivity doesn't exist. We all have subjective views. You need to be honest with what they are, figure out what they are, and determine if they're legitimate subjective views. Are they worthwhile or not? That's what we need to be paying attention to. Okay.